Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast, episode number 319, Toxic Masculinity and Cultural Change. BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Dr. Maupin and Brett are the authors of The Secret Female Hormone, the seminal work about hormone replacement therapy for women, which is available on Amazon or from Dr. Maupin's office at BioBalance Health. Dr. Maupin's office is currently accepting new patients. One of the terms that has been advanced in recent years as we talk about cultural change in America is the term androgyny. Androgyny is the, a, a continuum. Uh, from masculine traits to feminine traits. And the, the theory is that all of us have some traits for each gender. And so gender is becoming an important topical consideration uh, in the United States when we talk about culture in the United States. And what is our androgyny scale? How masculine are you? How feminine are you? And do you have or could you have uh, an optimal blend of both sets of traits? Is there a way that we can identify those traits measure those traits, educate for those traits, or is it all just genetic uh, guessing game? Is it just, you, you are what you are, you got what you got. Uh, can you evolve, can you change, and can we, uh, in our educational systems, influence the development of gender identity? So today what we're gonna be talking about is an article that was recently discussed in the Washington Post, the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, that was a discussion of an article that was in the Journal of Counseling Psychology about toxic masculinity. They identified 11 different traits that typically and historically have been identified as masculine traits on the androgyny scale. And he said, are any of these traits or all of them, some of them, uh, overly emphasized when we come to emotional distress in men uh, and emotional damage in our culture? Can we go through and identify any? And and it's worth, I think, talking about what the 11 traits are. Because gender education, gender identity, from a cultural perspective, begins almost at birth. And we Mm -hmm. start teaching our children uh, the difference in being a boy and being a girl. Messages that we give verbally, non-verbally, that we give culturally in terms of cartoons that they watch, in terms of toys that they get, color schemes for their clothes, uh, the importance of matching. I mean, my wife used to always say, I'm glad we don't have a girl because we'd have to have all these outfits that change and prettier her up and feminize her and, and, and teach her to have a purse. That prettier, her shoes, prettier her up. Prettier her up. And if you have a boy, all you need is like blue jeans and a T-shirt because they're just going to go out and get in the mud and get dirty and chase frogs and snakes. And, and, and she was adamant culturally. We will not do guns. We won't buy masculine boy guns for our kid to play with. He's not going to do that. And then she noticed when he was three and four running around the yard with a stick in his hand going bang, 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 shooting at things. So she realized there's more going on here than I have control over. So then we began to allow uh, guns. <laughs> boy things. Yeah, boy, boy toys. Uh, I remember well, when I was a child, my dad caught me playing dolls with a little girl next door. We were mm-hmm. sitting on the porch, and she had all these dolls and clothes and things, and I was maybe five or six. Mm-hmm. He got hysterical. He said, my boys are not going to play with dolls. They're not going to be sissies. They're not going to be gay. And he thought Remember how many years ago this was? Well, 63 yeah. years. So 63 this is a long time ago. ago. But the compensatory strategy that he used, once he told us we couldn't play with dolls, he went out and bought some action figures like you know, boy the, dolls, the Lone Ranger doll and the GI Joe doll. And they were dolls, but they didn't call them dolls. They called them action figures. So you could role a more, play a masculine interpretation of how you should behave. So, so backing off on, on what's, what was 60 years ago, yeah, it okay. has changed a lot. I mean, things have, well, things have, that is the question, they, but, but wait a second. Yeah, right. There's, there is a hardwired male, female, when we're born. I mean, there are certain things, they've studied this and found differences in our brain that are hardwired female and male traits that come from our genetics and the hormones that we are, we are swimming in when we're, when we're babies and pre and and pre-borns or before we're born. So when we are, we have that and then it's just like anything else, nurture nature, nurture nature. Well, yeah. So then it's then it's nurture, and you nurture according to what your societal 
rules are at that time. So when a child, that's why so many people who are 50 and 60 are so similar in how they view sexuality and maleness and femaleness and you and younger generations who had us as parents actually had more op- have more open views on what is acceptable as a male what is acceptable as right. a female males stay home now and take care of kids and and females can be the CEO of a company so we've taught our children something that we weren't taught and that we didn't really Embrace well, as young people, but we're trying to. Learning. I mean, I mean, which is part of we're the trying discussion. to fit into Can society. Can we train or teach for these traits that we want to emphasize or de-emphasize? You know, the the concept that a man is a breadwinner, goes out and challenges the world, mm-hmm. brings home the bacon, and the woman is the nurturer and stays mm-hmm. home and raises the babies. Now that we live in a society where half of the women, married or unmarried, work mm-hmm. uh, and are breadwinners, mm-hmm. then we have unusual situations. What if the feminine gender? is the larger breadwinner. If my wife yeah. makes more money than I do as a man, how does that affect my masculinity, my mm-hmm. sense of myself you just say in you're a lucky. manly way? I, I you could just say, say that. Great, we're making more it, money as a couple. But would it affect me in terms of aggression? Mm-hmm. Would it affect me in terms of depression, mm-hmm. of anxiety or stress or status? Mm-hmm. You know, when, when all the guys get together to play golf or poker or whatever we play, uh, do what are we I, talking for, about? For status <laughs> positioning, yeah. do I admit that my wife makes twice what I make? Well, why would you even talk about it? Because men do. That's this part of mine's bigger than yours is. How much? Okay. Is, how big is yours? Uh, and I have a good friend. So his, is that hardwired or is that learned? <laughs> well, that's, that is the question. I mean. But, but I have a good friend whose wife is a physician and he is an executive for a major corporation. Mm-hmm. And the poker gang all thinks that the physician makes a lot more money than he does. And he has to make a point to tell us regularly, I make twice what she makes. Right. You know, because that's the masculine imperative. Well, I didn't know that. So we never know what happens behind closed doors in male. In in either direction. Yeah, well, (laughs) that's true. That's true. But But, but this, what this is trying to study is there are many masculine traits. Many women have, I mean, some of these I have. Right. And... So women cross that boundary yes, and have many of these traits from the time they were little right. and kind of born with and created by the parents. But a lot of men have female characteristics and that's okay. I mean, being creative, being, I mean, taking care of children, nurturing. loving children, nurturing, right. um, that kind of thing is, is fine. And in our society today, we admit that that's all fine, but there's a group of males who have certain characteristics that are dangerous to themselves and to the people that they are intimately involved Absolutely. in. Absolutely. And, so and that, that's what this is really about. That's what this study was looking at. Are there, in this list of 11 masculine traits that they identified, are there specific examples of those that turn out to be damaging for men in terms of their health, in terms of their functioning, in terms of their impact on society? And their relationships. And their relationships particularly their relationships. So let's, let, let's go through the list of 11 traits that are classically identified as masculine. And then we'll find that three of these traits are, are thought to be overly important in terms of mental health and physical health issues for men as they age. Uh, so so the, the, the 11 norms that they identified and tested for, a desire to win, a need for emotional control and particularly emotional numbing, You know, you have to be able to shut down your emotions to function in dangerous environments, to to make decisions at critical junctures, what have you. We we want to not be overridden by fear, by anxiety. Don't be hysterical. Hysterical is a female term. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Uh, Risk taking, violence, dominance, sexual promiscuity, or playboy behavior. Mm -hmm. Uh, which again is often a masculine uh, trait that's reinforced in adolescence. Mm-hmm. You know, and young adult males, especially military age males, often s- seek status by talking about how many different women they've had. Well, their parents also sexually. accept that boys are going to be very be promiscuous and, women, and, and girls, girls are, aren't. Right. But right. but that's kind of a bygone theory. I mean, that's kind of an old theory because now we have birth control, so it's not nearly as dangerous for women. Well, when I was an adolescent growing up, the message to me and to men of my age was get the ones that you can get, but marry the ones you can't get. Right. You know, so. And we counted on that. And we taught our girls. (laughs) 
we taught our girls, <laughs> yeah. be good and right. save it for marriage mm-hmm. because you don't want to be one of these pass around girls that everybody gets. Right. Because you maintain your power as a, a female by with withholding your lever. Exactly. before marriage right. so that you're something special. But that's changed now. But I, I talk to young men and they, they, say, they say that they wouldn't marry somebody who they could just sleep with on the first date. Yeah. But they'll marry somebody who won't sleep with them. Right. Till like much later. Right. And and that's kind of one of their criterion, which I find to be unusual it's a mixed standard. It's, and it's old fashioned. Imprecise logic. Yeah. Uh, so it is. anyway, so uh, sexual promiscuity or playboy behavior, self reliance. Meaning pro- never asking for help. Never asking for help. You you've got to figure it out, you've got to do it to ask for help is ask for directions. I won't yeah. ask for directions. I'll figure it out. I have I have this tracker thing in my head that lets me know where I am. And, and you I always can, know you're right. Well, and when I'm lost, I've discovered a new way. When you're lost, I don't admit Phyllis lost. steps in and well, says, she, I'm asking for directions. <laughs> she does. Or she's a pullover. You know, yeah. Like, yeah. I'm like, okay, <laughs> you can ask to satisfy your need, but I don't need to ask because I know I can find my way. Because, yeah. Well. So uh, primacy of work, the importance of a job and job as an identity. Uh, people ask not who are you as a person. They ask, what do you do? You know, how do you earn a living? How do you make your mark in society? Uh, and one of the beauties of being retired is that now I can say I'm retired. You know, I don't mm-hmm. do those things mm-hmm. that we used as status markers right. uh, anymore. Or that could be I a mean, loss. I mean, I don't for use you. them as a, as a measure. Or it could I mean, be a you're loss always going to be a I've counselor. Lost my identity. Yes, yeah. I had a very dear friend who taught school for years and and was uh, like the best teacher, best. Everybody wanted to have. Him. Once he retired, he didn't have an identity. I mean, he had to go to counseling for four or five years to figure out that he was a person and had a life beyond being Mr. Smith in, in the history department. Well, um, I mean, to me, this is kind of a, an important crossover. Yes. Primacy of work is important to me because when I talk to people outside of where we live, they're like, oh, they talk to me like I'm a, I'm a um, stupid female. Often, like I'm not going to be able to take care of myself. Like I'm going to be, be because of how I look, mm-hmm. it's going to be, I mean, and I don't care if they don't like, I mean, if they view that as something that's uh, feminine and helpless usually, but then, then if they're really doing that, I find that very offensive mm-hmm. to anybody. So I, I then slide in. Yeah. Well, I'm a physician and blah, 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 especially. And oh, that, Harvard. and that, that is important to me as a power. To say, stop treating me like an idiot. <laughs> I mean, or seriously. You say, I'd shake your hand, but I can't lift my wrist. I just bought this big diamond and, and it won't let me. <laughs> Wrong hand. <laughs> yeah, okay. Anyway. All right. You'd have to be left handed. <laughs> uh, so, number nine is power over women mm-hmm. as a status marker, as mm-hmm. a sense of masculine worth and value. Uh, number 10 is disdain for homosexuality because homosexuality among men threatens our masculinity. Uh, am I less of a man? Is he less or more of a man? If he's interested in me, is that a message about me? I mean, in counseling, that it just was, means that you're beautiful. It was an interesting question. When I, when I <laughs> a beautiful would male. counsel individuals that had questions about their gender identity, mm-hmm. and they would say, you know, I'm attracted to you. Mm-hmm. The men would say, I'm attracted <laughs> to you. Waiting to see how I would respond to that. If I uh-huh. would be offended, if I would get abrasive, uh-huh. if I would attack, you know, could I absorb that message and understand it without having to posture in my masculinity? Well, many of the things we it. believe yeah. have to do with how people react to what we say right? and how they reacted last time. And should I use it this time? Right. And how should, you know, we do a lot of trial and error in behavior. Yeah. You know, so this is, so he was just trying to see. Where you were coming from, he was testing you. Or he was interested in whether or not I'd go along with that and and uh, right. violate all my boundaries and be his buddy. Because that happens too. Uh, and then number 11, pursuit of status. So these are what are classically identified as masculine traits. They did studies on these traits in terms of the correlation of these traits to illnesses like depression, uh, stress, body image issues, substance abuse issues, and negative social function. Depression. Do you, <coughs> do you act out? Do mm-hmm. you drink? Are you aggressive? Uh, you are you aggressive? Fights? Are you aggressive? Are you hostile? Uh, do you drive like a maniac? Uh, and there are different ways that masculine uh, traits manifest themselves, mm-hmm. and they come at a social cost. You know, mm-hmm. like like road rage. 
is, mm -hmm. is damaging. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so what they found when they did these studies is that three of these traits do correlate with what they call toxic masculinity, that they show up more frequently when men manifest all these negative character traits that have a, a personal or societal impact that we want to constrain, that mm -hmm. we want to limit or avoid all Because together. they're dangerous to individuals and society. And society, and, and especially relationships like uh, domestic violence, uh, mm -hmm. abuse of children, abuse of wives, uh, abuse of male partners. If, if we slide into those behaviors, then there's damage to the system. So then the question becomes, if we can identify, measure, quantify these behaviors, can we teach how to avoid them? Can we, can we reinforce them negatively or, or adversely? And we're only so talking stop. about three behaviors. Three behaviors so out of this whole list. Out of this whole list, only three were considered dangerous. Right. And that was playboy behavior, playboy behavior. power over women, and self-reliance, meaning I'm not going to ask any I'm not going to ask for directions. I don't ask the doctor for help. I wait till I'm dying to go in. You mm -hmm. know that kind of thing. Those are dangerous. Those are to they, you personally. They can be dangerous to, to your survival, to your function, and to society, and to society, and especially within the context of a relationship. Mm -hmm. So those are dangerous traits. And so then we begin to ask questions about how do those become taught? Is there a way to reinforce for choosing any of these other? Uh, eight traits mm -hmm. at different levels of emphasis and avoiding these three traits. Mm -hmm. and, and in doing the studies, they found some of the traits were correlation neutral, uh, like pursuit of work, the importance mm -hmm. of work in somebody's life. Uh, it can be a negative. It can cause all kinds of stressors or it can be a positive. And so it depends on the circumstances. And the person. Not just on the masculinity. Some people are, are stress motivates them. I mean, to me, stress right. motivates me. Right. But to some people, stress well, overwhelms them. motivates you. Mm -hmm. and, and there's some real determination and need to prove and need to assert that classically are identified as masculine traits. So mm -hmm. you're, you're further along that androgynous scale towards the middle, mm -hmm. which I, or I think over is the a middle. goal. <laughs> um, or the, that, I mean, more in the decide. middle. Yeah. But, but that is one of the goals is to how, how can we move more of us towards the middle so that we're not extreme? And, and how does that pay off socially? Well, for instance, in choosing the military, choosing the police. Do we select for these traits that could lead to toxic masculinity? For instance, right now, though the military is changing. Uh, in, in World War I, when they got such an influx of draftees into the military because they were using most of the soldiers as cannon fodder. They were, they were putting them in trenches and running them across an open field in front of machine guns, and, and the deaths were abysmal. They were mm -hmm. horrible, but what they needed was somebody that, that would take the order, get out of the, the trench, and run across the field and, and play and random. Sacrifice their life. And sacrifice their life. So life. they had to have risk-taking, desire the military, to win. Yeah. And uh, they had to have emotional control. And the status thing and the national mm -hmm. thing and the dominance thing and the right. bravery thing, all of those had to be there. Uh, now, when the military recruits, they're really looking for educated slightly older, not so much 18, 19 year old cannon fodder. They want mid twenties, late twenties, people that can, can be taught to use the technology because so much of the warfare now is technologically driven and the, and the instruments of war are technological. There are fewer and fewer soldiers are needed or used in situations where they literally personally, physically kill somebody or attack somebody. And those that are needed for that are recruited into special ops. And so mm -hmm. special ops is a significant part of our military That's a high expression status. around the world. It's a so high status somebody thing. who wants high but status. those are the guys that have the ability and the, the willingness to do those things. They have to be, still be I mean, very masculine. Absolutely. And without the da dangerous, they have, they have, they have to, to have, have control it. To I mean, I to, take care of a lot of ex or current military right. people, and they have to have the desire to win, and they do their their. Their or to focus carry out an assignment and reach but a challenge. their risk taking is low. Yeah, they don't. They aren't people who have terribly high risk taking, which is the dangerous one. Mm -hmm. But they have emotional control, meaning when they step into whatever room they are that's going to direct a battle. Right. They have to be able to be to take everything else out of the picture, and they have to control their emotions. They can't think about. 
people that they're kind of like a surgeon going after, and it's just like what I learned in medical school. It's I mean, I came from a his, my point. I came yeah. from a both male and female hysterical family. <laughs> Everybody got hysterical first, and then they thought that second. My definition was Italian. Yeah, well, my mom was Russian, so I mean, you know, but but the deal is, is that they I came from this, and then I get into medical school where they say no matter what happens. No matter if the, I mean, we had we had carbon monoxide coming into our operating room once. They said, you just shut down and do your job and get out of the situation as fast as possible. No panicking. Yeah. So in one way, that was great for me and any other surgeon. For In another way, as a female, the other women in the room didn't listen to me until I yelled. The men could be, be stern and slightly louder. I tried that. It didn't work. I had to go, okay, Carol, you have to go get this. I had to, you know, I had to really yell to get the attention I needed in an emergency. So it didn't quite work the same because of the response I got. Right. But I still had to be centered there. If the world ended and I was operating on somebody, my, my only thought was to finish my surgery and get the patient safely out of the room into recovery. Then the world could end. My son is an emergency room nurse, and he tells a similar set of stories uh, about uh, he was working in an inner city uh, hospital emergency room, and they would have gangbangers brought in who'd been shot or stabbed, but they were trying to save their life in the emergency Mm -hmm. room. And then they would have armed police in there trying to protect them because the gang was trying to come and finish the job. And shoot them. And so they had to be able to divide reality from the immediate medical emergency and treat this person Mm -hmm. and rely on other people to protect them. Right. And it's just, I mean, it's an incredible, but it's uh, necessary. If you can't do that, they should test you for that when you go to medical school, because if you can't do that, then really there's very few areas of medicine you can be in Mm -hmm. no matter what, even in psychiatry, even in counseling, you have to learn that as well. Because if somebody becomes violent, you have to be able to remain calm, remaining calm with them calms them down. So so the point is, these traits exist because they have survival characteristics, mm-hmm. and we need them in different amounts at different times. And the challenge becomes, how can we control the development, the presentation of these traits to minimize the toxicity so that the damage to the individual and to the society uh, is reduced or stopped, but mm-hmm. not eliminate the traits? There are situations, there are places where these traits are survival needs. And as a culture, we've got to be able to have them. We have to have all kinds of But we don't want them running wild. And so these studies are kind of interesting. And the one in the Journal of Counseling Psychology is is focusing on summarizing a lot of studies on masculine traits to try to identify what we call toxic masculinity. Those traits that bubble up in ways that are damaging because they're not uh, ameliorated, they're not controlled, and, and then the questions that are asked are how can we teach gender identity and how can we uh, reinforce for the levels that we want to have. And gender identity, you mean all of the different ramifications of gender identity. On the androgyny not, scale. The yeah, male, everybody, female, and except yes. everybody. Right. Except no, nobody should be an outcast because we're all different in a little bit of a different way right. and society requires that yeah. they require that one of us is not in like they do in the bible you're not an eye you may be a hand you may be a foot you may be you're all part of the same body mm-hmm. but you do different things well i saw a study years ago where they recommended female fighter pilots because they had better response to the g-forces they had faster mm-hmm. reflexes and they were less likely to get seduced by masculine, competitive, daredevil stuff. To do stupid stuff. And, and more likely to be just cold killers. Just go do it and get <laughs> oh, out really? of Really? I didn't know that. Not about proving their status, not about saying mine's bigger than yours or risk-taking. You know, it's just like, let's be a machine. Let's no mavericks. Efficient. Let's come home. Exactly. <laughs> so anyway, I would think you'll find it interesting. And uh, you can look it up in the Journal of Counseling Psychology or you can do a Google search on toxic masculinity and learn more. Thank you. Thank you. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com 
or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.